For more than 300 years, Portland's famous lighthouses have dramatically highlighted this treacherous coast. This briefly is their story. The rocky promontory of Portland Bill has long been regarded as one of the greatest navigational hazards in the channel. Currents clash as they pass over a vast undersea rocky shelf, creating a treacherous race of tempestuous waves. The Romans probably lit beacon fires on Branscombe Hill above Bill Point to warn sailors, but the lack of a local fuel prevented any regular light being established. Consequently, from the earliest times the island's coast has been the graveyard of countless ships. The earliest known proposals for a lighthouse at Portland Bill were made by London speculators, firstly Sir John Corriton in 1665 and then by Sir John Clayton in 1669. Any private individual could apply to the Crown to build a lighthouse. The desire to save vessels, cargoes and lives were not the sole motive, for handsome profits could be made from the light dues levied on passing vessels, collected at the next port of call. The Lighthouse Authority, the ancient corporation of Trinity House, had vested interests and rejected both of those early proposals. Then, in 1702, Weymouth privateers Charles Langriche and Captain William Holman saw the opportunity to raise funds for themselves, while protecting ships from the dangers of the coast. They sent a petition, which Trinity House again rejected, contending that a light at Portland Bill was not needed, and saying the petitioners could not afford to maintain it. Undeterred, Langriche and Holman kept up the pressure with the support of the first Lord Weymouth. In 1715 they petitioned again and gave compelling reasons for a lighthouse. They described the race, which yet leaves room enough of smooth water in good weather between it and the island for ships to sail without danger in the daytime, none dare venture there at night. It told of the sea running so high in the race, on spring tides and in stormy weather, that it was very dangerous even for the largest vessels to pass it. Several ships homeward bound have been seen in the channel, but never arrived at their ports, having been there swallowed up, not knowing how to avoid the race. Islanders have seen ships sink in storms, but never saw nor heard of such ships, goods or men, or any part of their wreck afterwards. The petition continued, a lighthouse on the south part of Portland, where it may be seen both eastward and westward, would prevent all these dangers and losses, and be of great benefit to all ships and vessels which pass the channel, to the saving of many men's lives, and the said lighthouse would be an excellent landmark in the daytime. This finally convinced Trinity House, who signed a lease for Holman and Langriche to erect one or more convenient lighthouses on the said island, with good and visible lights to be kept continually there in the night season, so as ships might better come to their ports without peril. Construction of the twin lighthouses proceeded rapidly, and in a few months the towers of the upper light on the top of Branscombe Hill overlooking the bill and the lower light just below it had been built. The first lights of the pair were kindled behind the glazed lanterns on the 29th of September 1716. Operation was difficult. The coal fires had to be kept going with leather bellows and the plain glass windows tended to become blackened with soot. The new lights potentially eased navigation around Portland, but complaints were made to Trinity House that they were sometimes not lit at all, with consequent disasters, 
as in January 1748, when the ship Hope of Amsterdam, laden with immense treasures, was wrecked on Chesil Beach, because, according to John Hutchins, it being very dark and no light from Portland lighthouses, either by reason of the great mist or the neglect of the persons concerned there. In 1752, two elder brethren of Trinity House sailed to Portland to inspect the lights. On approaching by sea, they were alarmed to note that it was nigh two hours after sunset before any light appeared in either of the lighthouses. As a result, Trinity House terminated the lease and took over the running of the Portland lights themselves. As time went on, Trinity House realised that the Portland lights were grossly inadequate. To remedy this, in 1789, the higher light was fitted with revolutionary oil lamps developed by the Swiss-born Aimé Argonde, in which the wick was enclosed in a glass tube, giving a clean, intense flame. A highly polished parabolic reflector placed behind each lamp threw the light forward with great brilliance. This was the first lighthouse in Britain to be fitted with Argonde lamps, which thereafter became the standard illumination for lighthouses throughout the world. Weymouth builder William Johns was then engaged to construct a totally new lower light tower to the design of engineer Samuel Wyatt. This was built on a different site so that the pair served as better navigation marks to direct ships clear of the race and shambles bank. This 19 metre high tower of 1789 was a very elegant structure. The doorway and windows were in Gothic style. It may seem strange to include such classical features on a functional lighthouse, on such a remote site, barely seen by anybody and accessed only along rough tracks. All becomes clear when we find that its architect, Samuel Wyatt, was, just two years later, to design the magnificent new headquarters for Trinity House in Tower Hill, London, constructed, of course, in Portland Stone. A further link to this island is that Samuel's younger brother, the famous architect James Wyatt, was about to produce his designs for Portland's neo-Gothic Pennsylvania castle. Inside Samuel Wyatt's lower lighthouse, a stone spiral staircase with ornate iron balustrades led to the lamp room, where six powerful Argand lamps were installed, and where preparations were made for a world-beating innovation. Experimental 21-inch diameter Plano convex lenses were installed by inventor Thomas Rogers to magnify the light from the burners. The trial was considered a success, and Portland thereby had the first lighthouse anywhere in the world to use a true lens. For the first time, these remarkable new optics could throw a concentrated beam as far as the seaward horizon on a clear night. This commemorative marble plaque was affixed above the door and is now displayed in the current lighthouse. The Portland lighthouses were in fine order when King George III came to see them in September 1791. Ten years later, the great lighthouse engineer Robert Stevenson reported the lighthouses to be in most excellent condition. The keepers kept meticulous records, as in this account from 1810, detailing the weather, oil consumed, hours of illumination and the number of ships passing, which on August the 10th included a fleet of 52 ships. In November 1824, the higher light was converted to a revolving one with three faces, giving a flash every two minutes. But 12 years later, this reverted to a stationary fixed one when it was upgraded with a new optical apparatus made by Chance Brothers of Birmingham. The Portland lights of 1836 were now among the most powerful on the English coast. However, France was now far ahead of Britain in lighthouse technology, 
partly due to the stubbornness of Trinity House to adopt new developments. Their elder brethren being mostly retired seamen, with no engineers or scientists on their board. Things changed when Trinity House eventually decided to adopt the remarkable lens system and oil lamps invented by Frenchman Augustin Fresnel, on which Britain's enterprising Chance Brothers were becoming world leaders. Trinity House then commissioned Chance & Co to install the Fresnel system at Portland in 1856, for which the upper tower was raised in height. By this time, Chance Brothers had become the leading supplier of lighthouse lenses around the world. Five years earlier, they had supplied all the 300,000 panes of glass for the fabulous Crystal Palace of the Great Exhibition in London. The number of naval and mercantile ships passing Portland Bill was increasing rapidly, so to increase range and visibility, in 1866, Trinity House's engineer-in-chief James Douglas designed two completely new towers for Portland. His new higher lighthouse was a two-storey circular building and its 11 metre high tower being built on a Portland stone plinth. From the 1820s British lights had been technologically inferior to the latest French ones but by now the scientific and mathematical genius of the Chance family and other specialists was shining through, and their firm became world leaders in their field. This company manufactured the helical lanterns for both lighthouses, as designed by James Douglas. They were first ordered dioptric lenses, fronting five wick oil lamps. When first officially lit in October 1867, the light's range was up to 18 miles. The new lower light was 25 metres high in five storeys and had generous quarters attached for the three keepers and their families. Inevitably, there were accidents. In June 1866, a carpenter, by the name of Carpenter, working on the building, had his leg crushed when a crane fell on him. Ten years after completing his two Portland lights, James Douglas accomplished the incredible feat of building the famous Fourth Eddystone Lighthouse a supreme achievement for which he was knighted. The structures of both the higher and lower lighthouses of 1867 have survived into the 21st century. But by the late 1800s their technology had become dated and they could not be adapted to house the latest apparatus. Trinity House decided to erect a new single tower close to Bill Point near a stone marker obelisk which they had erected in 1844. The story of the famous and iconic Portland Bill Lighthouse from 1905 through to the 21st century told in part two.